Hey, Julian. Hey, Mike. What's going on in your world? I've been hearing a lot about charity recently. Hey, we should look into charity work, shouldn't we? Yeah, and that's what I was thinking, which is why tonight we're going to talk with Chloe McIntosh, who was Nurse of the Year 2020 and who spent most of her career working in charity and shelter medicine. Let's get her on the show. Let's do it. Hi, I'm Mike Brampton. And my name is Julian Hope. Welcome to Veterinary Ramblings. Hello, Chloe. Hello, Hello. Chloe. Hi. Yeah, <laughs> very no pleased to have you, Chloe. Thank Chloe. you very much for having me. Well, welcome to VR and thank you for agreeing to, to come and play with us. It's, um, <laughs> it's brilliant stuff. <laughs> you, you've, had, you've had quite an interesting journey, Chloe. Yeah, yeah, it has. It's been, it's been a weird one. But... Yeah. We got there in the end. <laughs> uh, well, I'm I'm detecting a sh- subtle Scottish accent here. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, no, I'm I'm from Edinburgh, and okay. I moved down to Essex three years ago at the end right. of 2018 um, to live with my partner, mm-hmm. and been stuck here ever since. Because <laughs> 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 we all see the only way is Essex, and yeah, we know how how they talk there and what what goes on and things. So. <laughs> oh, yeah, I'll stop it. I'll shut up. Literally, that's. <laughs> oh. And luckily, well, luckily we'll, for we'll our, uh, luckily for our American listeners, this does go out with subtitles. Oh, thank God. <laughs> <laughs> well, shut my mouth. I'll oh, stop it. Oh, you're joking. <laughs> you do that very well. Yeah, I've had a bit of practice. <laughs> you do that too well, Chloe. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> you did your studying in Edinburgh, didn't you? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I went to the College of Animal Welfare um, for two years and did like the block release placement. So for a certain number of weeks out of the year, I would go to college Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and then they would send us off to our placements for like months at a time, couple months, two to three months at a time. Right. Each year. Yeah. So where did you do your placement? At PDSA in Edinburgh. Okay. One of the right. best practices right. in Edinburgh, I would argue myself. Okay. <laughs> okay. So is that what's got your is that what piqued your interest in in things like shelter medicine and charity medicine and things like that? Because obviously the PDSA, for listeners who, who may not be aware, is one of the biggest animal charity organizations in the country. Yeah, hundred so percent. Is that what got you into that then? Definitely. So the PDSA, um, prior to getting into college. I, the only, bless them, the only vets that would let me come in and do work experience was Vets Now in Edinburgh. And mm-hmm. that was only because I sent, I relentlessly phoned them, sent them emails and eventually turned up and said, please, <laughs> can you just let me in? <laughs> okay. And I think they took pity on me and were like, yes, fine, just come in. And they work out of PDSA Edinburgh. Um, so I saw in my work placement, like in the run up to college, I saw a lot of stuff through them. And then... I actually got offered a job of them as like their admin assistant prior to starting Ooh. college. And I got my way into PDSA that way. So I asked the head nurse, please can I do my placement with you? And they said, right. yeah. Right. So was it, wow. was it important for you to work in a charity-based practice at the start? Honestly, it wasn't. I had no idea what veterinary medicine really was about. Um, stepping foot into vets now was the first kind of veterinary experience I ever encountered. And I didn't really up until I qualified and kind of got out and had a bit more experience, I didn't really appreciate the difference between like charity medicine, general practice, you know, referral centres and everything that lies in between. So it wasn't important for me to begin with, but it certainly became very important as I realised what I enjoyed and what I didn't. Right. Okay. So, so, so Chloe, you've, you've described there a real, a real drive and determination you know, you're you're going to do this thing. You've set your target. You're going to do this. What got you into it in the first place? What, into charity medicine or veterinary nursing? Veterinary nursing. Veterinary nursing. Yeah. I'll be honest, I was stuck in a bit of a, a dead-end job. So I um, worked at a like, really no, well-known kind of high street bank. I started off in the call centre, moved to business bank and absolutely hated it. Got into fraud, which I, I really enjoyed. But... It got about a year into it, and I was like, "I'm just, I can't do this for the rest of my life. I need." Sorry, when you say you got into fraud, did, mm-hmm. do you, 
we, 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 we can't we can't be hearing any um, any confessions of crime here. We, I'm, I'm sorry. <laughs> I should tell our victims we, we don't condone fraud. Okay? No, I I did not become I did not commit fraud. Oh, all right, sorry, I missed it. <laughs> do, do do carry on. I got into the fraud department and kind of you know, um, per, uh, identity theft, but only not fake bank accounts, that kind of stuff, which is really interesting. It's you know, it's I'm sure it's it's much different now than when I was first in it, but I just it became very redundant very quickly and that was kind of my goal I set myself when I started off in banking and it just wasn't what I expected it to be in the long run so I made the decision um I remember two very different career paths I spoke with my mum and I said I don't want to work I've always wanted to work with animals I need to see if I can do it or I'm going to go into fashion and mm-hmm. animals won <laughs> <laughs> wow you. so how old were you when you made that decision then um I was uh, 22, 22 when I started my nursing course. Mm-hmm. Right. Okay. So you you haven't you haven't taken the traditional. Well, I say traditional. Um, a lot of people that we talk to have have made up their mind by the time they're eight years old. Yeah. Mm. That they're going to become a vet or a vet nurse or a, a technician or they're going to become a surgeon or or whatever, mm-hmm. and and they drive through from that. So you've you've come to it quite late in that regard. In, you know, compared to an eight-year-old, 22 is pretty old. Yeah, no, absolutely. And, you know, I was terrified. I was like, am I too late to be doing this? Am I too late to be starting? And even mom and dad, when I spoke to them, I'm sure they won't mind me saying, they were like, oh, you've got a good job. You know, you're settled. Why don't you just keep at it type thing? And, I, I, like, you know, it's quite difficult going from a decent salary down to nothing at 22. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and starting over and I was like but if I don't do it now it's just going to get more difficult to do it and I'm going to be miserable and um yeah they were <laughs> really happy when I qualified and finished it because I'll be honest I, I never stuck in at school I was a nightmare at school didn't care didn't concentrate wasn't interested right. um and so didn't really do very well right. by all accounts mm. so it took it took the long way to get there but I got there in the end interesting i and has it has it fulfilled your expectations? Do, do you? Because I guess a lot of the a lot of the ones that go in at, at, at uh, a school level um, because they wanted to do that ever since they were sprogs uh, kind of feel disillusioned after mm. a few years. So we 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 it's a well known fact we we have a, a big attrition rate of, of nurses. They they go through all their training. Uh, really intense uh, several years of training and and, 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 yeah. and then it doesn't quite fulfill what they want does it that doesn't the job doesn't match up to to their ideals is that different for you going in as a class a mature student yeah no definitely um i think partially don't get me wrong there was still that kind of almost like dunning kruger effect where i went in and i was like this is amazing this is the best i'm never going to get tired of it and you know reality does sit in there's parts of the aspects of the job that are difficult and you wish you didn't have to do and you would rather not deal with but i think going into it with a bit more of like worldly experience at, at 22 <laughs> and um, a bit more yeah. of like a well-rounded mindset did help um and actually the the college that i went to college of animal welfare i think in, increased their admission age just to ensure because I think that that's a problem they were having they were getting in people who were aged maybe 16 17 yeah and were really struggling with the course yeah so yeah I think it did definitely help going mm. into an older age it you know, I was laughing while you were saying that because um just before you came on Mike and I obviously we we, uh, we, we have many many days of discussion before we have a guest on to work out what we're going to say <clears throat> but just before we came on we were, we were thinking yeah, what well, what we're going to talk about tonight any, any ideas and um mike said well, we're not we're not going to talk about dunning kruger because you know chloe only qualified in uh, uh 2016 so you know so, phew, we won't get anywhere on that and we agreed <laughs> yeah absolutely but, but there you go first first big question you say you know there's a dunning kruger uh, moment Ted, talk us through that i mean that's um... that's a that's a more mature outlook anyway isn't it <laughs> <laughs> yeah I'll be honest I've just finished my top-up degree and it was kind of one of the modules which I absolutely hated um which was called I think workplace professional development and it kind of was a reflective assignment on how you would achieve um 
and how you would change your outlook in in regards to like something that you were really passionate about that you started out with and then ended with Mm -hmm. and it did take a little bit of of me researching and that that came up and it was kind of my approach to to things like preventative medicine or clients not following advice and it was like oh they're just they're just doing it to be difficult they're just they're not listening and actually Mm -hmm maybe it was more my approach than them Mm -hmm. that was the problem it was definitely more me so I I happened to stumble upon it I think during this reflective assignment and it's it's really helpful actually I did a one-to-one with one of my newer nurses and she was saying how her confidence levels have suddenly dropped off and I was like Mm -hmm. it's a good thing and we went through it together and yeah I I think it's a really really good kind of I don't know what you would call it but I think it's just something really helpful to be aware of yeah Hmm. No, it, does. It, it is and and um we were chatting who was it we were chatting with a few weeks back mike but I'm uh, absolutely yes I'm it, that's it uh and we were talking about well she hypnotized us basically you know, she hypnotized us and um she did give us some tips because we can actually change the way people react to us yeah and change the response that that, that people would have given us by the way we approach them and by the way we chat to them. So, okay, so, so Dunning Kruger is, is I'm, I'm thrilled you've mentioned it. <laughs> I'm thrilled you've mentioned it, Chloe. But before that, you also mentioned some things that you didn't like doing that you had to sort of, I suppose one of the expressions we commonly use is man up and, and get on with it. Personal. Personal, Personal. <laughs> yeah. Let, let's, let's, be, let's, be, let's be woke, shall we? Um, <laughs> You had, to, you had to person up. You had to stiffen your sinews. Dig you had in. to grow a selection. <laughs> stop there, Julia. I'll, I'll stop. I'll stop. So, 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 which parts of, of veterinary nursing do you not like? Um, I think sometimes the difficult cases, and you do see them quite regularly in Caribbean shelter medicine. And I think what kind of came to fruition not too long ago was that it's not always what what can be really difficult is it's not always deliberate and those are the easier cases to deal with because it's deliberate cruelty that person's you know bad like it's easy to be angry at them and there, there's an easy solution mm-hmm. whereas people sometimes the naivety or the kind of the ignorance through no fault of their own just through a lack of education a lack of you know this is their first pet they don't know what they're doing yeah um can can be really traumatic for the animal in, in certain conditions, certain um certain issues that arise. So dealing with those situations, I think sometimes can be really upsetting, mm-hmm. you know, for you, for the animal, for the client as well. And nobody ever really explained just how deep you kind of go into client relations and and managing the client as much as managing the animal. So yeah. I actually do like it now, but when I first started out, I was like, this is a lot and it's you know I hope you don't mind me saying the nurse is usually at the forefront of that mm-hmm. they're the ones yeah people feel a bit yeah. more comfortable speaking to they kind of as soon as yeah. the vet leaves the room they kind of go was that okay <laughs> they, they open up a bit yeah yeah absolutely and, and yeah. I, I always say that to my nurses look I, I've told the owner exactly what I want them to do could you tell them exactly what I want them to do because <laughs> they go away and Basically, that they they'll no matter how gently I'll have chatted to them, no matter how thoroughly I think I've gone on to things, they're frightened. Mm. Talking to a vet is a frightening thing, just like talking yeah. to a doctor, because you're worried for uh, for yourself, for your pet, for finances, for whatever, and you need someone who doesn't have that direct uh, involvement, if you like. Yeah. Um, and I don't, I don't mean the nurses don't have. Uh, direct involvement they do but but that specific um point of care well it's it's the it's the sitting in the doctor's office blah 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 cancer yes blah 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 yeah. blah 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 yeah, yeah. Blah, they're blah, petrified blah, blah. in the first one place. tablet twice a day or it'll die blah 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 yeah. die <laughs> yeah. And, yeah 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 yeah. And that's all they'll pick up on. Whereas the, the nurse, the, the nurse is usually a safe person to chat to. Mm. They're they're non-judgmental. They don't raise their eyebrows when the owner says, Well, I do feed him a chocolate biscuit. <laughs> yeah, you know, the, the, the nurse will say, Okay, 
we shouldn't be doing that. I'll tell you why later, but carry on. Whereas <laughs> Vets is, yeah, gosh, no, you just told me that, on. and it's cost you two pounds. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely. I think but, that that was a major kind of learning point for me. And it's something that's now enjoyable, but kind of through maybe the harder times or that learning curve of how trying to manage it yourself, trying to figure out how to approach them and how to manage them in the long run can be really kind of traumatic, yeah. which is a bit sad. And obviously the, the, the cruelty cases as well, the cruelty, the neglect cases, they're never nice to see. And it, it is devastating. Mm. Some, some of the conditions you see animals come in and how they're still alive is just so upsetting. Yeah. Would you say, would you say that most of those cases? Because I, I like to believe the best of people. So, would you say that most of those cases are neglect through poor education, or are you seeing a lot still of of really nasty people doing nasty things? So, I think a certain amount, and obviously everybody has their own kind of, I suppose, threshold for what they consider neglect. Mm-hmm. You know, I know some nurses that consider not having a cat neutered by the age of one neglect and that is that's fair enough but some people you know the dogs all scabby and scaly things like that it's covered in fleas it's not on death's door it's still got a loving home it's got a warm bed it's got food and water and Mm. that's just through kind of the the educational gap and there's nothing wrong with that that's why we're here that's why we step in you set up a regime you educate the client and usually things are nipped in the bud but there is always that kind of small percentage, and I say small, seeing it in a sheltered environment, it is really channeled through, so you do mm-hmm. see a lot of it. Unfortunately, there are some people who sh- just shouldn't have a hold of animals, and there is some really nasty, deliberate cruelty cases mm-hmm. um, and deliberate neglect just because they can't be bothered. Mm. That's, that's, yeah. That must be really hard to deal with, seeing that. Yeah, it's Did- devastating. I think that probably in the cases that where you know there's nothing else you can do and the kindest thing is to put them to sleep and it's cases like that where it's like the last interaction of that animal shouldn't be its most recent like interaction of kindness and it's just things like that get you know people get really upset and I've got really upset and it, it, it really takes its toll um but again you've got the other end of the spectrum where you get animals come in that are really neglected but the, the individual, the owner's got a really horrible issue going on as well. They might be an animal hoarder. And I, I did a little bit of CPD last year, an animal hoarder, and I'm no expert by any stretch, but two out of three of the categories of animal hoarders mm-hmm. don't do it deliberately to be nasty. It's like an underlying obsessive, obsessive yeah. compulsive disorder condition. So th- they actually need the support, but it's just really hard to get to. Mm. Yeah. Absolutely. So what you've described there is you're seeing a disproportionate number of, of abuse cases or, or or however you want to describe that, um, animals that uh, have not been looked after as, as perhaps they ought to be. And that takes a mental toll on people, doesn't it? Definitely, 100%. You- There's been times where, bless off your partner, I think the last thing that really affected me badly I got all the way home after a night shift. It was an hour's drive. I got all the way home. I think I got in the shower after my night shift, got out, and I just burst into tears. And it's it's really horrible. Like, I think you've got to address it and got to let yourself grieve sometimes to get on past it. Otherwise, you, you're just going to break down. Right. Do you, do you have any particular techniques or coping strategies that you use or that you'd recommend? I think just crying, I'm a big crier. I think just crying, <laughs> there's absolutely nothing wrong with it. Like literally just let it out and you will feel a lot better and you might feel worse before you feel better, mm-hmm. but you will eventually feel better. And just, I think remembering at the end of the day, you've made a different, you've made a positive difference to that animal, whether it's like small or large, you've mm. actively been involved in helping them. And that's that's something to remember there's been a difference made. All right. So that, well, that yeah. brings me, that brings me beautifully onto my next question for you then, Chloe. So I've asked you about the negatives and I've asked you about how you cope with the negatives. What are the highs? Cause there's yeah. gotta be some. Um, I think probably see it rehabilitation, what? like abuse or neglect cases. They're, they're amazing. Absolutely amazing to see how far animals can come and how, mm-hmm. how it doesn't, obviously it does affect them, but some animals you just, you would never know. You would absolutely never know. And you see them go off to these fantastic homes with people that are going to treat them right. 
mm-hmm. and it's just it's really heartwarming um and I think being heavily involved a couple of weeks ago um we had a case where a client signed over some hand your kittens no problem in that that individual was really sensible in what she did she said I can't do it so please can somebody else help and now they're all they're all doing so well there was a bit touch and go at some points but they're out now all going to really good homes all with staff members so that that's really nice to see that's you know I mean you can't really appreciate it any more than that yeah, yeah. And, and you mentioned um earlier education of clients and that's something that you're keen on isn't it yeah definitely and, and education in your profession as well you're you're a a clinical coach yeah yeah I am yeah. I'm, I'm my um, we've got one student at the moment at my working apprentice and I'm a clinical coach mm-hmm. um but yeah no I just love it I love it especially seeing that light bulb moment like sometimes with clients as well and just seeing them apply arguably is a small difference you know whether that's the flea treatment whether that's reducing down the, the food intake slower exercise and they get to the the end goal which they never thought was possible and they're really happy and they're proud of themselves and it's nice because they should be proud of themselves so many people write right off like the chats they have with vets or nurses and they're like oh no it's not you know if it's not a pill or a surgery it's not going to help but actually the management at home like they should be proud of themselves it makes them a really good pet owner and it's it's mm-hmm. amazing to see yeah yeah sure you sound is. you sound very very supportive in in all of your endeavors here both with with owners um whether good or bad um <laughs> and and your your fellow nurses nursing colleagues and uh, and the rest of the profession is well understand that you won nurse of the year award <laughs> yeah i did i did i won it last year i was really I was totally shocked, absolutely shocked. But really, I I was to be honest. Things like that you don't really hear about, like happening to like people around you or you. Um, and you know there was millions of worthy candidates, especially the year everybody had. So yeah, and no, I was very very honoured <laughs> to have won that. Well, that's fantastic. And and so you were voted by your by your peers and by the clients. So it was, I, I was nominated, I know, by Bless Her, the hospital assistant, who is now a student vet nurse, and she is, mm-hmm. she's a fantastic student vet nurse, she'll go on to do fantastic things. Mm-hmm. Um, she nominated me, and just I think she knew I was having a bad time, because I'm not always supportive to be around. I was a nightmare before I left my previous job. I was really burnt out. It was, I was horrible to be around. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think just prior to that, she nominated me, and it, it was it was so lovely reading the things that she'd written it was really really nice right that's interesting so i'm I'm talking to you now so you know i I can't believe you're horrible to to be around (laughs) yeah Um, so chloe hearing that that you were voted by your by your peers as as vet nurse of the year i find it hard to reconcile that with someone who in your own words wasn't nice to be around and so somewhere or other there's a problem isn't there that that uh why why weren't you nice to be around and more to the point why didn't your colleagues recognize that that you were suffering from stresses that made you not able to present the the affable uh outgoing giving compassionate person that that, that you clearly are because we we work in a compassionate practice uh, 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 business yeah. profession so what, what do you think it is? Why, why can't we recognise in our colleagues that, that that they're suffering from burnout, that they are stressed? I think, to be honest, and it, it's a really grey area because absolutely we need to do more for individuals suffering from burnout. But in that same breath, your co-worker's happiness is not your direct responsibility. And I think it needs to, it's a very difficult line at all because sometimes if you make it your responsibility, mm-hmm. then you know what I mean? Your you know, misery loves company. So it's just, you're going to get, sometimes you feel yourself getting dragged down. If somebody cannot get themselves out of that rut, and at which point I think I, I was pretty much in that rut. I was like, I don't care. Like if someone's trying to be positive. I was like, oh, this, that, moaning about everything, really horrible mindset. I kind of understand some, some people did, and pick up on it it was mentioned and I was I think I made the decision to move on because I was upset after 
somebody who who I actually I, I think a lot of and I really respect as a veterinary professional. I remember kind of unloading on them a little bit and they were like, yeah, mate, you're just really different to how you were when you started. Maybe you should look for something else. And I was like, I was devastated because I was like, I can't believe that they don't want to be around me at work. When actually they're fully entitled to be like that because I I was a nightmare. I was horrible. And I've come since come across people like that in my career. And, you know, sometimes some days where you've got your own stuff going on or it's a difficult day for a difficult client or a really sad, poor case sometimes you do only have enough kind of preservation for yourself and that's okay mm. but like I said it's a really great area I know everybody wants to be supportive but you need to take care of yourself as well mm-hmm. so what yeah. what enabled you to pull yourself back again then what I am um, I, I made the choice to to go for a different job and I think that's that's really imperative if it's becoming too much a, a place to work if things aren't changing you know, it's the definition of madness. You doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. Mm-hmm. So, mm-hmm. if you give it, you give it a fair chance. Nothing changes. You've got to make a change. Right. So it's, you, it's the you task of the Sisyphus, trend. isn't it? <laughs> yeah. So Sisyphus, who was doomed to push the rock up the hill every day and every evening, he would uh, he would fall down to the bottom again. Yeah. Um, and actually, you, you can't help feeling that Sisyphus should have just got a different rock or a different hill or thought bugger it I, i'm going to still fire like my mate prometheus because <laughs> having, having my liver pecked out has got to be better than this yeah <laughs> literally yeah strap me to a big rock and let the eagles come for me yeah. it's just yeah that's it eventually and you know that that co-worker that i worked with i don't i, I was really hurt but i don't think any less of her and i think that's completely valid like you know, we're all, if, if you're struggling at a place of work, it's very likely that everybody else is as well. It's not just you struggling with the workload, with the chaos, like during COVID, it's all very difficult. Um, so, yeah, no, after that, I think I kind of made the decision. I was like, well, look for something else. I can't keep going hmm. round and round. Are you, are you still in touch with her? Um, yeah, I am, to be fair. Not as much because, you know, you know, I mean, work colleagues kind of, you get closer to them while you're at work and then... Yeah. You, you move on so that's understandable but no i'm still in contact All right okay yeah interesting interesting it's um it's, it's a profession where there are lots of stresses yeah. and, and covid hasn't uh, hasn't helped really has it oh god no um, but the, the i think you're right i think that we we have a responsibility for our colleagues to a certain extent but actually we also have a responsibility to our colleagues. And if, if we're suffering from stresses that actually are bringing other people down and there's nothing we can do to, 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 to change that, that, then maybe it's a sort of square peg round hole thing sometimes. And we, we just don't fit in that, in that scenario. Mm-hmm. Uh, definitely, mm. definitely, and I think sometimes you know it's not always about the job. Sometimes it's so people get really nervous, don't they, about taking time off? But mm-hmm. if you need if you need a break, if you need anything, change some aspect of your life. It's okay to do it, whether it's the job, whether it's your personal life, whether it's you just need to take some time for yourself. It's it's all right to do it. So mm. it's being kind to yourself, really, and yeah. not beating yourself up about things that have happened or or whatever. Definitely, just taking that time. Okay, so so what what what's your pet project at the moment then? My pet project at the moment, yeah. um, at the moment, probably supporting my, my apprentice vet nurse through our college work. Uh, right. We had a really hectic last few um, couple of months getting getting our new. We've moved on to a different system. I used to be on the MPL, which was very straightforward. This is not very straightforward. Yeah. So just yeah, just focusing on her and giving her the support she mm-hmm. needs. Mm-hmm. You find you find that satisfying, a hundred percent. Yes, well, you've got to say that, haven't you? In case you listen. <laughs> <laughs> no, absolutely not. Listen, I she's a fantastic nurse, and not even no, it's not frustrating because that sounds really like argumentative. She's she's so competent. She's mm-hmm. absolutely amazing. I just wish she had the confidence to go with it sometimes. And we're mm-hmm. getting there. We're slowly getting there. But she just, yeah, it's just amazing to watch her grow into the brilliant nurse that I know she's going to be. Well, that's Dunning-Kruger again, isn't it? Yeah, 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 yeah. definitely. Yeah. 
<laughs> Brilliant stuff. Brilliant stuff. The more she is knows, it... the less her confidence is. <laughs> is it um, is it difficult getting time to to, to to devote to training her at the practice? Because I know we, we're a training practice, and the, there's the constant uh, question of, well, okay, how are we going to factor two hours here, an hour there? How are we going to do that? Yeah, no, it can be quite difficult at times, and I've had the um, the chat with like my senior vet because they were a bit concerned about me being the clinical coach, and I said actually we only need like a couple of hours a week together to go through tutorials to explain things. You know, we're quite easy going about our communication styles because we communicate outside of work as well and I don't have a problem doing that Mm -hmm, Um, mm -hmm. but realistically it's utilizing the other nurses in the team and the vets and the VCAs because they all know so much so I've explained that she needs this experience to complete certain tasks but it doesn't always have to be with me so pairing her up in certain days when there's surplus staff when it's a bit quieter and she can go off and learn from other nurses it's just me signing her off when she's competent. So I think yeah. it's just utilising that and just not micromanaging the poor girl <laughs> into the ground. Right. Well, having that list on the wall saying, please, please, can someone find a catheterization for, <laughs> for, for Jenny, for whatever? <laughs> Literally, yeah. <laughs> elbow we x-rays. We need elbow it. x-rays. I, I found myself thinking the other day, do, do I advise this client that they need x-rays on their, on their dog because um, that's the only thing left for her to sign off? No, I, I, I didn't. I didn't. <laughs> no i know don't we've we've had Haley. she's got a pet rabbit and they insisted we needed a, a rabbit for x-ray so we didn't take an extra of the rabbit but we had to like pose the rabbit on the x-ray table and take a picture of the poor thing to show we have an exotic <laughs> in x-ray <laughs> yeah yeah brilliant stuff uh that's superb hey I, I, did i read somewhere that you you like to travel yeah, no, I do like to travel. By travel, I mean just get out of the UK. <laughs> <laughs> now, pe- people people were able to do that once, weren't they? Once yeah. upon a time. Yeah, I'll so, be honest, I was one of the lucky few that got out of the UK last summer. Oh, right. Um, yeah, I was hell-bent on getting out. I was like, I'm not, not doing it. Excellent, and, excellent. Where did you get to? Um, Ibiza in Spain. Right. Ah, right, right. Yeah, the Valerics. Um, where me and my partner are getting married out there there next year. All right. Congratulations. Yeah. Congratulations. Thank Brilliant. You. So, yeah, I had this really nice hotel booked, and the dates kept getting changed. The the flights kept getting cancelled, and I don't know how I did it, but <laughs> I managed to wow. we managed to get out there. And we were there for oh. five days, and it, it got moved to the the quarantine list. So I had to quarantine when I came back, but I didn't care. Yeah. It was, it was <laughs> worth it for those five days, was it? I was out there for ten days, but oh, on right. day five we got the news, and I was like, "We're just going to have to roll with it." Just, just go, just go for it. Yeah. And, and uh, is it Spain you tend to go to? Um, I really like Ibiza. Bless my partner. He used to go there a lot uh, at the time when he was younger with his family. So not like the party area right. but mm. the kind of quieter aspects of the island which is beautiful it's, it's got amazing food everyone it's really safe really friendly um and just a really nice place to go so i love it but the novelty wore off for him when he was about 13 when he kept going with his family so i sure. insist that we go all the time and he's like can we please try somewhere else but <laughs> <laughs> we have been we have been elsewhere we've traveled to like um new york bali hong kong like we, we have been quite quite far mm. away together Right. Wonderful. And and you're learning Spanish. I'm trying. I am trying. Not not very well, but <laughs> I'm using Duolingo. So my partner's it's become a bit of a contest mm. that he's winning at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> you, you you really need to go out to the country to, to practice there, don't you? Yeah. Because my, my my wife and I are learning Greek. We've been learning Greek for the last ten years. <laughs> and we still. We still can only. I mean, we we can we can construct reasonable sentences, but the problem is if people then answer us in Greek. Yes, and it's so go, fast. Uh, like... Then Catalano, <laughs> I, I don't understand. Yeah, yeah, it's me. It's fast. Lo siento, lo siento. Yes, <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, brilliant sorry. stuff. Brilliant. <laughs> I don't know. Okay, so uh, Chloe, have you come across the sixty second CPD challenge? Yes. You have? Are you I up have. for it? Yes. What would you like to do it on? Uh, feline preventative medicine. 
feline preventative medicine. Okay, so prepare yourself then, Chloe. Chloe McIntosh, charity vet nurse, one minute on feline preventative medicine starting now. Okay, so why I think everyone should be involved in feline preventative medicine. So the neutering of felines in the UK is imperative to managing the ever-growing feline population crisis. I think we should all be encouraged to consider at least neutering cats from four months of age as they reproduce like cats, but as the more well-known metaphor like rabbits, they um, neutering them from four months of age not only reduces the risk of unwanted litters, it also reduces the risk of pyometra and feline mammary cancer, which um, increases with every age, that the risk increases with every age they remain entire. In male cats, it also reduces the risk of things like roaming, of them being involved in road traffic accidents, of them fighting, which causes things like cat bite abscesses, and it massively it reduces the risk of them contracting diseases such as feline immunodeficiency virus, which can be debilitating and can lead to death. And there you are. A minute. <laughs> One awesome. minute. Awesome. What? That, that, that was fabulous summarised. <laughs> We oh, are goodness. we are not we're, worthy. We are not <laughs> worthy. <laughs> we are not worthy. That was Chloe. That was fantastic. That. Thank you. <laughs> you didn't prepare I was so that. Stressed. I was so stressed. <laughs> this is this is why this is why you are vet nurse of the year. That was <laughs> absolutely. That was absolutely amazing. Thank you. That, that was absolutely amazing. What a and, beautiful and, um, summary. <laughs> perfectly encapsulated. Really, yeah. really Thank perfectly. You. So. The, the essence then of, um, of preventive medicine is, is neutering, really, isn't it? That's what it comes down to. A hundred percent. Honestly, it's such, it's one of those things where, you know, people always argue neutering, is, is it in the best interest of the dog um, in a bitch and in a male dog? Cats, it's always in the best interest, a hundred percent, a hundred percent. And I know that's a strong opinion, but get them neutered. Honestly, you wouldn't, there's no regrets surrounding cat neutering. I'm mm. totally in agreement with you, Chloe. I really am. How many do do you have any figures for, for for how many unwanted cats there were in the UK last year? I don't have any figures, but I know it's millions, absolutely millions. Mm. Um, and you know the the amount. Just I, I finished my shameless plug. <laughs> I um, I finished my honours project this year, mm -hmm. and I did it on um, a comparative study of FIV rates among neutered and non-neutered cats in the uh -huh. um, RSPCA hospital. Yeah. And, of all the FIV positive results, 89% belong to male entire cats. Is that right? Wow. Yeah, out of, out of a group of, I think it was like over 400 samples that yeah. had been taken, 89% belong to male entire cats. And this Incredible. is because and they are roaming and socialising. It's because, yeah, it's that because they're fighting. And there was, you know, when I was doing my research, there's multiple studies looking into kind of trap new release projects, monitoring feeling behaviour, um, aggression levels, and all of it's wildly reduced. And actually, mm. even neutering them, there's arguments that you can keep an FIV cat is very risky, and I wouldn't condone this. Um, you can keep an FIV cat and FIV negative cat together if behaviourally they're okay, because really they need a deep penetrative bite to transmit the virus because it doesn't live long in the environment, you know, sharing bowls and stuff. It's not as scary as we once thought. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we used to think it was through mutual grooming, didn't we? But it's, it's very unlikely to, to be passed that way. Yeah. It, re it really is through some sort of penetration. So uh, fighting and um, other, <clears throat> yeah, things. Um, <laughs> Yeah, m moving on from that. But actually, <laughs> isn't it amazing that, that, that very few, not very few people, a lot of people still don't neuter their cats? Yeah. And the number of, of road traffic accidents I see, because I, I do a lot of orthopaedic surgery for our local PDSA and RSPCA clinics. Mm -hmm. uh, and almost all of the fractures I get in from them are from uh unused male cats yeah because because they wander off yeah because they're raw men looking for territory or a female or another cat to fight but that's right and you say well we, we can vaccinate against various diseases you can't vaccinate against getting hit by a car but actually if you've got a cat you can do the next best thing which is to neuter it so neutering is vaccinating against being hit by a car if you're a cat 
a hundred percent because there was a study mm. I can't remember the results a study in Brazil and it said that they monitored the um like the Roman distance pre neuter and post neuter and again it reduced drastically after cash so the evidence is there for for people that want to want to question it it's definitely there. are mm. yeah mm. you mentioned in your email to Alicia uh, with regard to, to to charities that actually you wanted a bit of a shout out to to all animal charities or to people really to to, to try and support all animal charities because they're struggling aren't they during covid absolutely so and this is not a guilt trip by any means but the um the the support and the financial support that a lot of these organizations rely on has been cut drastically understandably people are out of work they can't afford to give but in the same sense these charities can't afford to operate at the same capacity they once did they've had to make cuts in regards to staff they've had to make huge cuts in regards to their financial outgoings and unfortunately that means like slashes across the bottom line um, so I just want people to consider that and to just remember if you can't get immediate help it's not for lack of trying it's it's because they purely can't yeah because well, it annoyed me on the on the on the wireless the other day I listened to the wireless and uh, the, the presenter was saying that uh, they're hoping that the DIY industry is going to pick up quite quickly because people now have all this money they haven't spent on holidays and things and then the next article was um the save the rhino trust was going under because people weren't paying for that anymore and i thought well, actually hang on if if people are saving so much money that they can now afford to buy huge amounts of paint couldn't they have put a fiver in the save the rhino tub yeah. Uh, and so there's 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 something else that's gone on, hasn't there, in this last year? And I think a lot of it is the the sort of the chance meeting with uh, with a charity. So you're on the high street, you're just about to go into a shop, and there's someone holding this leaflet up in front of you, saying, "We, we want to save the um, uh, the, the, the binturong. Could, could you could you give us some money?" Now, most people wouldn't come across that from the comfort of their own home. But if they're outside Waterstones, you might think, oh, I will say the binge wrong. I like those because they smell of popcorn. <laughs> so that, that doesn't tend to happen at the moment so much, does it? And that, that's a big problem with charities. Actually, people aren't minded or mindful of charities because they're not going to places and seeing the banners, seeing these people shaking mm. their pots and things. Yeah, absolutely. And it's it's difficult because obviously you can't have those individuals out in the community for obvious reasons. COVID, you can't risk it. We've started to see some. There's a local, um, I think she's Dogs Trust, a local Dogs Trust lady at my Sainsbury's. <laughs> Bless, I was in my PDSA uniform and she was like, you've got a minute. And I was like, I can give you money. <laughs> I've not got a minute. You can take the money, but don't. Please don't stop me. I'm too busy. Um, and it's just, that's the reality of it. People are, I think, too too busy and the lack of it you are losing out on a massive fundraising opportunity so so many fundraising events that were previously booked obviously mm. haven't gone forward yeah. and um people don't want to know and i think a great part of it is and we're all guilty of it people want everything straight away they want the help they want it quicker they don't understand why it can't be sent out for things like you know for one example rspca unfortunately they get a really difficult time in the media and people just don't see what goes on behind the scenes sometimes they only have one inspector for like Essex in the east of London that's a huge area yeah yeah and, and as a vet I'm constantly hearing from clients I stopped giving money to the RSPCA because they only spend it on uniforms they don't do anything but the RSPCA do a huge amount and actually they are the only animal charity with legal powers to, uh, to, to to seize, arrest, and, um, and 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 push sentences forward to animal wrongdoers, aren't they? Oh, as, in, as in bring prosecutions. Bring prosecutions. Yeah, yeah that's right. the word. That's the phrase I was looking for. <laughs> Thank <Right>. you. <laughs> You're welcome. Thank yeah, you. absolutely. And it's just it's rushing because they've got this. I don't, I don't know where these vicious rumors started from, but they're like, oh, they just. It, it, this is one of my major arcs, but they're like, oh, you, um, you know, I don't give money because they just like, that's all they're bothered about is money. It's just a big money making game. And then the same breath, it's like, oh, they don't do anything for animals. They just put them to sleep. And it's like, 
well, what, what money do you think that is there in dead animals? There's none, you know, like they, they, yeah. the two yeah. don't correlate. So it's just, oh, it's just really difficult because they do so much work. They're wildly understaffed, underappreciated, and people kind of write them off because somebody's not available to come out and pick up the fledgling that fell down half an hour ago. Mm. Absolutely. And, and um, I think in this culture, we're, we're very much mindful of the negatives, aren't we? Yeah, we're, we're very, very keen to pick people up on their faults rather than praise them for their uh, for their attributes. Yeah, definitely, mm. and it's really sad. And just, mm. I think if they if they understood, if you said we literally are, are stretched to beyond breaking, if you could bring that animal to your local vet centre, you know, not that we won't overwhelm any local vet centres at the moment, but legally they have to give first aid advice, and that first aid like assistance could be the difference between that animal surviving because it might just need warmth and, you know, a bit of nursing and then the inspector comes and gets it at a point where they're not overwhelmed. Mm. Absolutely. And I would say, as a vet in practice, I would say, please, Joe Public, bring any stray animals or animals you're worried about to the vet. Yeah. Take that as your first port of call. Give them a buzz first, out of courtesy, then they're your only way. If uh, they honestly can't deal with it that they will tell you where best to, to take it but yeah. don't they just think no no i, I don't want to i don't want to do i don't want to overwhelm them or I don't, it's not my problem that's the worst thing isn't it oh, yeah things being an scp to to, <laughs> to coin um douglas adams phraseology as somebody else's problem yeah an scp it's mm. very frustrating oh, actually doing that it's satisfying like i don't i'm not saying this to just you know what I mean just get my own way but it's really it's so important that I don't think the public realise or, you know, anybody realises the difference that one, like, minor act can make. It's not a minor act. Like, you're literally saving time and money and vital resources by doing that. Hmm. So it's so hmm. important. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> I, I, I'm, 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 I'm pausing at the moment because I'm, I'm struggling with thinking with, there are so many other ways we could go, but um, uh, Mike, Mike and I... Are, in constant communication on uh, on texturing this, <laughs> steering it, and Mike has quite rightly mentioned that you have delivered a minute of prime quality CPD, <laughs> and we think that needs a certificate for our listeners because uh, they, they they have benefited from uh, from from CPD. Oh, so, absolutely. So, I, so I have happen, you got a certificate? Do you know what I happen to have? A CPD certificate here, <laughs> and, it, and it says it says yups, another certificate. <laughs> this this certificate entitles the listener to approximately thirty credits at whichever outlet accepts such credits. So please <laughs> take your certificate along to to your local shops or the RCVS and, or the RCVS <laughs> and say, look, this this allows thirty credits. Can I put this towards something? And they may unfortunately say no. <laughs> it's a possibility. Or they may say, yes, that's £100 <laughs> off your next car. So do, do use your certificate. It may, it may come in. So what, what, what you got on tonight's certificate? Let's then, try it out. So I've got, we've got, Let's have now, a look. We, we've been speaking about the, the cat population density and, 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 and uh, the fact that uh, neutering cats is all important. And, and here are some cat migrants uh, in. Uh, in Greece, there's three cats on a moped trying desperately to to escape uh, yes, Greece yes. And, and and perhaps seek asylum elsewhere. Here's a little dog also following the the Greek theme. This little dog that, that I saw last time I was out in Greece with a tumor that must have weighed oh, a, about about the same as its little brother. Uh, I thought it was lying on a cat. Absolutely, it's, it's a huge tumor. So he's really fat. And and you notice the dog has a collar. So this is an owned dog with a tumour that must weigh, I mean, the dog itself probably weighs eight kilos, and of that, the tumour must be two and a half to three kilos. Um, I think we're doing okay in this country. Yeah. There's work to be done everywhere. I think we are. Hmm. Um, here's a snow leopard, just to brighten things up. I think we <laughs> need that. Now, on the other side of things... Uh, on, the, on the bottom right, here's a cat that unfortunately was shot twice by uh, by an air rifle. Is actually doing fine, really 
fine and um, we we noticed these uh these pellets so it's got a pellet uh in the maxillary region and just probably the mandible uh i picked up on, on, on these uh, because it came in with dental disease oh my god and in the in the process of 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 looking at its teeth i felt this little lump and thought i wonder what that is so we took an x-ray and there were two two air rifle uh, pellets and it had been shot probably a year or two before the owner remembered it coming in one day quite distressed oh. um can I say utter, 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 utter bastards on different ramblings? Yes. Yeah. Good. Okay, I'll say it then. There we go. <laughs> uh, rhinos. I knew we were going to mention rhinos, mm. so I, I put a picture of a rhino on there <laughs> uh, without any steerage at all. And the other thing is, look, here we go. Here's a cat with uh, with seven toes Fantastic. on each foot. And we call that polydactyly, don't we? Yeah. <laughs> and, and this is... The only reason I put that in is, is the one good thing about stray cats is that you can get things like that. And if you go to Cuba, you'll see a large number of cats with polydactyly, with numerous or super really? numerous toes. Uh, because Ernest Hemingway took a cat out to Cuba when he retired out there that had seven toes on each foot. And he was a randy bugger. And <laughs> he was Hemingway. Fought. Yes, absolutely. Oh. And, and, and his cat was as well. And he um, his cat impregnated so many of the local females that now there's a reasonable portion of, of cats in Cuba that carry the, 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 the male uh, dominant gene of polydactyly. So oh, you know, th- th- there is a positive benefit sometimes to strays, but, <laughs> but generally we, we mentioned that, that we can reduce FIV, FELV, road traffic accidents, um, pyometra, mammary tumours, roaming incidents, generally with uh, with neutering. And thanks very much, Chloe, for, for pointing that out in an <laughs> absolutely faultless 60-second CBD. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> That's brilliant stuff. That's brilliant. I don't know. Well, I, ha- I have to say, Chloe, it's, it's been an absolute pleasure speaking with you this evening. Thank you very much. And you too. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, I'll I'll echo that. It's fantastic. Yeah. Really, thank you so much. And and I'm I'm sure your your Instagram uh, followers will be very keen to listen to to what you have to say. I hope so. (laughs) Well, I hope so too. I'm sure they will, Chloe. Don't don't, uh, don't hit us with this Dunning-Kruger stuff now. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> no no problem at all so i think really probably all it all it remains for me to say is that if you've enjoyed what you've heard tonight um don't forget to click like subscribe um and please keep in touch with us and let us know what else you want to hear about and we'll do our best to provide so there's nothing else to say other than chloe mcintosh uh, charity vet nurse Thank you very, very much indeed for joining us. And although we've talked about cats, may your dog go with you. (laughs) May your dog go with you. (laughs) Thank you very much. Chloe, thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Bob. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, Chloe. Good night. Bye. 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 Bye.